Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone had a good lunch. And uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me here today. It's, uh, I've, I've spoken at PSG before, but it's been a lot of years. Uh, one interesting thing I realized in looking at my presentation is that the last time I did this, I think we had, I must have had to go through 20 different guidances and policies and, and notices to actually give a complete picture of the uh, bioequivalence requirements at the time. And it's not so much that the, ch the requirements have changed all that much, but that uh, in about 2012, we managed to consolidate a lot of that uh, information into a couple of key guidances. Since then, we've accumulated a, a couple more uh, updates that I'll touch on today. But uh, it's not nearly as, uh, as involved as it once was. As a result, my talk will be shorter than it was at that point in time. Um, oh, I'm supposed to have a little control here on it. There we are. So I will, in my talk today, I'll just be touching uh, briefly on our current guidances because we're the, the theme here is more of the update uh, nature of, of things rather than going through everything that we're currently doing. And I suspect the people involved uh, in the room who deal with bioequivalence are pretty familiar with our, uh, our current guidance documents. So I'll just go through those more briefly. I'll then uh, talk about some of the more recent publications, um, some of our, uh, a couple things that we have ongoing right now in consultation, and a little bit about, uh, a little bit about the future. So um, briefly going through our current situation, our current bioequivalence guidance documents, uh, we have two key guidances. Um, the first being the uh, conduct and analysis of comparative bioavailability studies. I think um, people are likely aware that this is our primary guidance for the actual design and conduct of uh, comparative bioavailability studies and bioequivalence studies. As I was alluding to earlier, when this was published in 2012, it consolidated uh, many uh, previous documents, Guideline A, Guideline B, Report C, and uh, several other uh, notices and, and smaller documents. It uh, uh, provides advice on planning a study, things like the selection of studies, the design of the study, conduct, uh, selection of tests and reference products, the uh, bioanalytical methodology, and the statistical analysis, both bioanalysis bio and statistical analysis of the, uh, of the outcome. Now, that being said, it covers the, I'll say, usual situation. Although in this day and age, the, uh, uh, with some of the products that uh, the generic industry is starting to look at, some of these uh, base requirements are no longer adequate and, and some uh, customization adaptation is necessary to deal with some of the different, uh, different types of products. Um, for things outside the guidance, of course, we always encourage uh, industry to uh, contact us in advance and discuss how they are, are thinking of going about their bioequivalence or bioavailability studies. It's much easier to, to have that discussion uh, prior to uh, to investing in uh, in a development plan or investing in in studies which are potentially the wrong studies or not being done in in, in a way that will satisfy the uh, the regulators' expectations, the other key guidance, uh, which is companion to the the conduct and analysis, is the comparative bioavailability standards. Uh, formulations used for systemic effects. It was published at the same time as the other one in 2012. And this one outlines 